I'm Francine Lacroix and welcome to Bloomberg's Front Row. Today, I'm talking to Noel Quinn, the chief executive leading HSBC through its most radical overhaul in years. The expectations are high. Noel's predecessor was ousted by a dissatisfied board. Now, this 35-year banking veteran has to show he was the right choice to run the largest bank in Europe, one with a long history in China. Let's be honest, you know, if you want to be an international bank, serving the world, serving 60 markets, at times, it can be difficult. And I'm not going to deny that. Noel was already making big changes even before clinching the chief executive role. In his first interview, since becoming chief, we talked about revamping a 156-year-old institution, his expansion plans for China and beyond, HSBC's green transition, and why he's taking a tough line on crypto. Plus, the enormity of challenges from returning to the office to retaining talent. Here's my conversation with Noel Quinn. So, Noel, you've had quite a busy two years. You became chief executive formally. You've had the pandemic. I mean, how has that shaped your strategy for the bank? Well, clearly the pandemic was a major influence on everything we've been doing over the past year, 18 months. But I want to go back, actually, when I first took over. You know, there wasn't the pandemic. It hadn't taken hold at that time. And we embarked on what I believe is quite an ambitious transformation plan. You know, we, we committed to sort out some unprofitable businesses that we had. We committed to really releasing those good businesses we had, particularly in Asia, transaction banking, and investing in those. And I'm really pleased with the progress we made. But then the pandemic hit early last year. Um, the health crisis was a global one, as we all know, but led very quickly to an economic crisis. And the most important thing for me is the way our people responded. They were superb. I'm really proud of the way they pulled together. They supported our clients. They supported the communities that we serve. And they did it when they themselves were going through significant change. You know, their families were at risk, they were at risk. 90% of 230,000 people were doing that and working from home. I mean, it really shows resilience. Yeah. Where are we in the strategy revamp? Are we halfway? Is there I'm, more to come? I'm pleased with the progress we've made. If you, yeah. if you look at each aspect, I committed to reducing risk-weighted assets in some of our unprofitable businesses. Uh, we're 85 billion done after 18 months out of a target of 110. Um, I'm pleased that we delivered significant cost reductions last year. We reported that. You know, we took out nearly 10, well, about 10,000 headcounts. Uh, we reduced the cost base significantly. We're on track for our cost reduction plan. Um, and I also said that I would address the profitability of our retail business in France and our retail business in the U.S., and as you know, we announced just a few weeks ago that we're selling our retail business in France and our mass retail business in the U.S. So that's good progress, yep. but there's still more to do. How difficult is it to position HSBC with these growing tensions between the U.S. and China? Uh, listen, geopolitics, you know, we've been around for 156 years. Uh, we've faced uh, political tensions in that 156-year history. Let's be honest, you know, if you want to be an international bank, serving the world, serving 60 markets, at times, it can be difficult. And I'm not going to deny that. But our clients tell us they still want us to bank them globally, whether they're consumers wanting to invest elsewhere in the world, their savings, or it's businesses wanting to trade with the world. The demand we've seen over the past, even in a crisis like the one we've just faced, the demand from our customers to serve them globally still exists. But are authorities asking you to choose between one or the no. other? No. no and no. clients? No. We have to comply with the laws, the regulations in the markets in which we operate in. That's a complex task. I'm not going to pretend it's easy. But no one's asking us to choose. You've lived in Hong Kong. Does that yes. help you actually straddle both dimensions? It helps you understand the markets. You know, I, when I lived in Hong Kong, you know, I, I served you know, over 22 countries, 22 markets. I traveled regularly, I saw the clients, I understand their businesses, I understood the economies. I was frequently in China, but frequently in India. And it gives you that, that understanding of client need. And at the end of the day, we're a client-led organization. And if our customers are telling us they want us to bank them globally, they want us to help them navigate the complexity of world trade, then that's what we should do. Do you think those complexities will get even more complex? Listen, I can't predict the future, but is it 
a complex world we live in? Yes. Has it become more complex over the past couple or three years? Certainly. But um, that's when we step up and help clients navigate that complexity. Um, I'm not going to pretend it's easy, but it's rewarding. So, so how much of your time do you spend actually trying to navigate those complexities in China? I think last year it, it consumed more of my time this year. Um, it, but I, even then, last year, what really consumed my time was, was helping our people serve our clients in one of the worst health crises in the world uh, that's faced for over 100 years and an economic challenge that was huge. And I, I want to give you a fact, Francine. Um, in the first eight weeks when it became a global pandemic, in February and March of last year, our colleagues helped our customers borrow an incremental $41 billion in that eight-week period. Now, what's really remarkable is they did that working from home. They did that digitally, not in person. And that was $41 billion of not approvals, but money out the door. Now, that is the strength of this organization. And I, that's why I say when I talk about our colleagues and being proud of what they did, that's an example of what they did. You've moved a lot of your executives to Hong Kong. Would you ever move to Hong Kong? Uh, listen, I've lived in Hong Kong and I loved it. Um, but I'm going to stay in London. But it's right that three of my executives, particularly, they're the three heads of some of our global businesses, wealth and personal banking, global banking, and commercial banking, are moving to Hong Kong. It's great for them. Um, they get to experience that, that growth opportunity. You know, Asia is a phenomenal growth opportunity, not just in Asia, but for our clients as they expand globally. And it's great they're experiencing that. And I want them close to the opportunity and close to the growth. But I'm staying in London. Would you ever move headquarters? No. Why not? No, we've looked at the domicile many, many years ago. We're not reopening that. Um, we're a global institution. London's a good market uh, to have a headquarter. Um, we operate in over 60 countries. All of those countries are important to our franchise. Asia is a huge opportunity for growth. Hence, I'm investing $6 billion in Asia in the next few years. Hence, I've asked three of my colleagues, plus my head of asset management, to go and base themselves in Asia. But that doesn't mean I have to move the head office. Have you had any pressures, actually, from authorities no. in Asia to move? You don't no. think that's coming? No. What are your expansion plans in China? Are you hiring? Yes, we're hiring. Um, we've announced a commitment. We are an initiative called Pinnacle. Uh, that pl the plans there are to hire 3,000 extra wealth managers over the next three to four years. Uh, we've already hired 600 of those in the first uh, nine months of the program. Um, we're on track for our target for hiring this year, and the initiative's going really well. It's meeting business case expectations. When we hear China say that actually they want to have a fair society, what does that mean for wealth creation? And what does it mean for, for your pivot and your you know, focus on China wealth? Well, let me talk about wealth creation from a China concept. I mean, if you think about the number of cities in China that have over one million uh, urban population, you know, there are different statistics out there, but it's certainly around the 75 to 90 mark. Now, many of those cities have gone through urbanization over the past decade to 15 years, and they're going through GDP per capita growth. And we're starting to see those cities turn into strong consumption markets. And as they develop consumption appetite, when they, typically when they get to GDP in the double digit, you know, 10 to 12 to $13,000 per head, that's when they start to think about wealth products insurance, wealth management, investment products. And that's where I think the huge opportunity is. And by the way, urbanization hasn't finished. There's still more urbanization to come. So I think we're on a long um, transformation program within China where the creation of wealth, and it's about definition of wealth, it's not super wealth just, it's wealth for the middle class and it's wealth for the urbanization that's taken place. That's why I think everyone's interested in China as an opportunity for wealth. And don't just think about wealth in China as the super rich. It's also wealth for everybody, and it can be as simple as an insurance policy.
So with the latest crackdowns and extra regulation, you don't really feel like it will veer you off No, course. I still think it's, um, it's an important market opportunity. It's an important market need to serve. And it's not going to change our investment plans. How do you think that the Chinese authorities are looking at banks, international banks at the moment? I mean, all of the signals I'm getting is China is still keen to open up the banking sector and the financial services sector in China. You know, they're willing to allow increased ownership stakes for joint ventures, where previously you had to be a minority shareholder. Now they're allowing majority shareholding or 100% shareholding. So they're going through an evolution where they're, they're evolving, the, evolving the financial services sector and are making it more open to foreign investment. And, and we're interested in that, but I'm sure my competitors are as well. So are, are you applying for more licenses to actually operate in China? We're always applying for licenses. But we, as an international bank, we hold more licenses than any other international bank in, in China. But there are always more that you can look for as they open up the market even further. Do you look at China in terms of a three-year plan, a five-year plan? Or is it more nimble, given some of the changes we've seen? Oh, no. Uh, you, you really got to look at China as a minimum as a five-year plan. And you've got to really, in that five years, be laying the foundation stones for the next five after that. Um, you don't look at China on a one- or two-year or three-year operating cycle. You've also bought something in Singapore. Yes. Do you have any more acquisitions on the table? Uh, we said at the half year that we're willing to consider bolt-on acquisitions, particularly in the area of wealth management, asset management. Uh, we're pleased to announce the, the purchase of the AXA business in Singapore. We see that combined with our own existing operations in Singapore as an ability to accelerate uh, our organic investment plan, uh, so that's great. We're looking at uh, two or three or four other bolt-ons, uh, and for bolt-on, you know, if you think about the Singapore one, you know, you're looking in the order of four, five, uh, six hundred million. So it's not a big acquisition, any one of them, but it's all about building out capability, accelerating the investment plan to accelerate the revenue growth. Any particular country? We're looking across Asia. Um, yeah. um, we're looking at areas across Asia. Clearly in China, we'd like to continue to invest in China. Um, uh, we feel as though we can do most of our growth in Hong Kong organically without having to buy, uh, obviously. Um, but then in the rest of Asia, Southeast Asia, India, we are looking at further opportunities. You think we'll have something this year? or I can't say for definite, <laughs> but we're trying to. Um, talk to me about Hong Kong, some of the laws that, you know, the sanctions law. If it comes through, like, what, what does it mean for the financial sector? Uh, listen, as an international bank, you know, as I said, we've been around for 156 years. Uh, one of the jobs of an international bank is to comply with complex laws and sanctions laws wherever they're implemented. Um, and that complexity has increased, uh, but we'll navigate that as we have done so far and we'll continue to do so going forward. But you have to stay close. Uh, you have to stay close with your clients and with the regulators to understand their requirements and to navigate those complexities. But it's certainly a complex situation at the moment. Meaning that you try, you try and stay a, a step ahead so that you see it coming and can adapt? No, or I think you, you can't always see what's coming down the path with you know, governments and regulators will form their regulations. Um, and some of it you're aware of and some of it you're not. And, and sanctions policy um, will hit you and you've got to deal with it. Um, but we've been dealing with sanctions policy, you know, for the past 10 to 15 to 20 years. You know, sanctions policy is not new. How much do your clients ask you about it? Um, more so in recent uh, months and, 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 and the, the complexity of, of different sanctions policy operating at the same time. Um, but I say the peak, the peak client dialogue was probably, you know, five to ten years ago. And now the kind of questions you get are, are, is my money safe? Is my money not safe? Like, what do, they, what do clients ask you? To be honest, they, there are answers we can and can't give. I mean, I can't, I can't predict what a government will implement in terms of a sanctions policy, but I have to comply with it. You know, I don't get consulted necessarily, as any international bank will, uh, by authorities when they're formulating their sanctions policy. Uh, but any international bank, HSBC or any of our international competitors, have to understand that policy and implement it. It's not optional. On Brexit, yes. how will it change the City of London? Well, 
I'm very confident on the City of London. Um, and I believe, you know, I, I look at Brexit and say Brexit's done. Um, we were prepared for Brexit in whatever form it took, whether it was a very hard Brexit, a soft Brexit or no Brexit. We put our plans in place. Brexit has now happened. We've adapted. Um, and we're moving forward. And I think the f general feedback I get from my clients in the UK is they're in that same frame of mind. It's done. Brexit's done. Let's move on. Learn to operate within the new environment. Uh, do I think London will still be a very strong financial services market? Absolutely, post-Brexit. How much do you spend actually thinking about sustainability? We've seen demand for sustainable products increase. Huge. But also a lot of questions about whether you know, financial institutions are greenwashing. No, it's a huge topic, and I think it became even more urgent through COVID. I think COVID was the wake-up call for, for so many people, me included, on how fragile the world is to a natural event. And, and I think the pace of change, the dialogue that's taking place today relative to 18 months ago is much greater on sustainability. So I think it's both a huge opportunity whilst also a huge risk to manage. And by opportunity, let me just clarify what I mean by that. You know, in our 156-year history, we've seen the industrial landscape change dramatically, the commercial landscape. You know, it's, it's unrecognisable. I think in the next 10 years, we're going to see a similar transformation take place in the industrial, technological and commercial landscape. Why? There are industries today that are carbon heavy. They will need to transform their technology base their business models to be fit for a net zero world of 2050. That creates huge opportunity. There's also risk in that transformation. And what I want HSBC to be is at the center of that transformation, leading that change. And I quantified what that meant back in October of last year when we published our sustainability strategy. I believed through all the analysis we've done for HSBC there is an opportunity to finance that transition, to help those customers build new business models. I quantified that at somewhere between 750 billion and a trillion over the next 10 years of either investment that's needed to be funded on our balance sheet or through capital markets. But often we're not talking about the same language. So there's concern that actually, you know, certain funds, certain banks are overstating some, some of the sustainability impact. Yeah. So how do you avoid that? I, and that's where we've got to take the reporting. You've got to have transparent and consistent reporting so that the words financing the transition are not just a marketing strap line or a strategic strap line. That people, stakeholders, investors, regulators can decompose that and say, I understand what your balance sheet looks like today. I understand the targets you're setting to work with your clients to finance the transition. And I understand the progress reports that you're issuing every six and 12 months through your report and accounts. And in that regard, we're developing, as other banks are, our own reporting methodologies. But we're trying to do it in a way that's consistent. So I also chair a task force of like-minded banks, about 11 of us, who are trying to set a framework of disclosure that if you use the phrase finance the transition or achieve net zero this is what it means and there is an architecture of reporting that we put in place that allows the readers of our reports to understand how we're doing that what are the major headwinds that you could potentially see i mean we still we we're very pleased with the progress on vaccination in many of the markets we operate in uh, and that has therefore led to a uh, a revision of our, our loss ratios the, because the economy is stronger than it would otherwise have been. Um, now, clearly, we're not out of the woods yet. COVID it still exists. The Delta variant still exists. Great progress has been made. I think we need to see how the next few weeks and months develop. How do you expect the return to the office to go? Uh, listen, I, my own view on the return to the office is it would be a waste if we didn't learn from the last 18 months. You know, if I think about the future, do I want the future to be the way it was pre-COVID 
on working environment. And let me explain that in more detail. Over 200,000 of my colleagues, 90% of them work from home. Not everyone could because they had to work in branches or work on trading floors. But a lot work from home. Now, I trusted them last year to run the bank globally in 60 countries. And they did a fantastic job. I'm not going to turn around to them now that COVID's over and say, guys, I no longer trust you to work from home. You know, not all jobs can be done from home. I'm a realist. There are certain roles that have to be performed in premises. Also, offices will always have a place because offices are great environments for learning, for innovation, for collaboration, and from team building. But I, I don't have to translate that into a statement that says, right, now work in the office five days a week doing emails and VCs when I've just trusted them to do things at home for the last 18 months. So I, I'm learning, but if you want to label, I'm probably more inclined towards the hybrid model for certain roles. Could you sell off offices? Well, we're already uh, reducing the office premise uh, space in the likes of London here. Now, we're doing it less by selling off, more pulling out of rented premises and pulling back more to this building in Canary Wharf. So we're getting greater use, greater occupancy. Uh, we intend to get greater use and occupancy out of a smaller fo office footprint. So that's a fact. And we, we told the market that we would expect over the next three to four years to impact our office footprint, head office footprint, by around 40%. But again, you've got to be realistic. You can do that in certain markets. You can't do it in all markets because not everyone has the same capacity to work from home. Um, not every role can be performed from home. Of course. Uh, what, do, what do your employees say they want? Do they want the hybrid model or flexibility? Yeah, if they can and they're not doing office, essential office-based roles, around about 70% of them would prefer to do a hybrid approach. So, so is that good also for talent retention? I mean, talent wars amongst banks, is, yeah. is it peak? I, I, listen, I've been around banking for 35 years and there's always been a talent war. Um, so it goes through cycles, though, and it's, it's intense in certain parts. But do I think it's good for retention? Yes, I do, because I think people want to work in an environment where there's an opportunity to learn and collaborate and teamwork, mm -hmm. But there's an opportunity to be an individual as well. There's an opportunity to ex to be yourself, and 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 you know I we use the phrase work-life balance so so easily. You know I I've looked at it from my own point of view. You know I control. I've always when I was coming through uh, my development curve, I always felt I wanted to have a degree of control over my own destiny and my own life. Now. It's hard to do that if somebody turns around to you and said, I don't care what your personal circumstances are, I don't care uh, what you want to do, but I'm mandating you're here five days a week when there's no need to be here five days a week, particularly when you're facing a one-and-a-half-hour commute into London. It's different. So, listen, I, it's for every leader to choose how they want to move forward. What um, segments of, of banking do you see more talent wars? So I feel like every day we have a story about junior bankers being paid 110000 120000 Chinese quants apparently paying them $300,000. Yeah, there is clearly a, a very hot market at the moment, particularly in investment banking, at all levels, not just the junior levels. There's a, uh, there's a very hot market at the moment in global markets in the, in the, in the trading businesses. Um, but, you know, they go through phases. Um, we're very fortunate in that we have some really top quality individuals that are working for us, but competition for talent is the same as competition for customers. It has always existed and always will. Do, do you have to increase your prices? Uh, your pay? Pay. I mean, we've always got to adjust. We want to make sure we're market, uh, paying to market, that we're competitive and that we're keeping our talent. Um, so we, we monitor the market pay levels very closely. Will you or your executives and your executives travel less post-pandemic? Yes, undoubtedly. Uh, again, it's part of the learning curve. Uh, it would be a shame if we all went back to the way it was where we were flying around the world for one-day trips here and two-day trips there. Um, so my expectation is I will probably do fewer, longer trips. My expectation is that will translate into probably 
a reduction in our travel budget by around about 50 percent uh, which is quite for the bank as a whole quite impressive yes uh, that's my expectation um, now at the moment we're nowhere near spending the balance of the 50 percent you know because there's still so many travel restrictions but we've learned to live and operate in a very different way uh, video conference has worked um, you know I remember one day sitting at home I traveled the world in a day uh, talking to clients in different parts of the world now you can't do that forever you still want to have face-to-face -face interaction I'm desperate to get see, to see some of my colleagues in in our markets and spend some time with them for a different type of interaction a more informal interaction um, you know, talk to me about diversity. So there was a, a pretty explosive, actually, expose by one of your employees yeah. that the media really picked up. Has it changed in any way your thinking? I mean, I think first and foremost, um, when that came to our attention, the first thing we did was talk to uh, the individual concerned, understand his concerns and his, his allegations, and, and commence the formal um, investigation to make sure that we were following up on anything that he raised and, and we're in that process. Uh, the second thing I'd say, you know, we are absolutely 100% committed to creating a diverse and inclusive culture. You know, you can't be an organization that operates in 60 countries and not believe in diversity and inclusion. Um, I've remained at this bank for 30, nearly 35 years because I felt as though as an individual, and we're all different, I felt as though I've worked for people who valued me as an individual. They motivated me, they mentored me, they trained me, they inspired me. If there were times when I was possibly thinking of doing something else, it was when you didn't experience that. So if I enjoyed that and I felt that motivating, then I want that as a leader of this bank for every one of our colleagues. And when somebody says they're not experiencing that, then that hurts, and that's, that's, that's something we've got to address, and I've got to make sure that doesn't happen. So I want a diverse, I want an inclusive organisation, and we will do everything we can to improve. Now, I'm also a realist. I'm not naive. I know there's more we need to do. I know there's more I and my leadership team need to do to make progress on diversity. We've made, Such as? We've made good progress on gender, but there's more still to do. We've put an awful lot of effort into matters of LGBT. It's clear we haven't done enough for our black colleagues and they feel as though they haven't had the same opportunities that others. And that's why I set a target that by 2025, I want to double the representation of our black colleagues in our senior leadership ranks. And I want to make further progress on gender diversity. So. I've got an agenda that we're working on, I'm committed to it, and I'm not naive to think everything's perfect, and I will make sure that I will keep working on that agenda. Um, talking about cryptocurrencies, yes. so you were definitely on the, the very cautious end yes. of cryptocurrencies. Has that changed? No, and let me explain, because it's important to step back. back. Yeah. Um, when I think about cryptos, whatever the form is, I look for two attributes, I, or I look at two dimensions. Firstly, transparency. Secondly, convertibility or volatility. Let me deal with transparency first. Particularly with respect to cryptos, it's important to understand who the counterparties are. And are those counterparties transparent to each other? And are they transparent to the intermediaries like banks and regulators? Because in the world of high expectation on money laundering controls and sanctions control, a lack of transparency can get you into trouble very fast. Second dimension, convertibility or volatility. I look at that from the point of view of if somebody wants to hold a crypto currency, what's that cryptocurrency worth? And is that client suitable for that level of volatility? And if I'm lending money to a corporate, let me give you an example. If I'm lending money to a corporate and their balance sheet is denominated in US dollars, 
their sales ledger, their, their receivables, their cash balances, our US dollars, sterling, euros. I'm able to form a reasonable assessment of the value of those assets. Now, if those assets are denominated in a cryptocurrency that can fluctuate plus or minus 10 or 20% in a day or a week, and I've got to make a lending decision, do I lend money to that company? How do I value that balance sheet? So for me, there are certain types of cryptocurrencies that score highly on transparency and convertibility. And clearly, central bank digital currencies score highly on that. There are other types of cryptocurrencies that don't. Bitcoin. I'm not going to name any one of them. <laughs> but I'm looking at it at a theoretical point of view. Yes. And then there are certain clients that can cope with volatility, and there are certain clients where I'd have a conduct issue if I encourage them into volatility. So I, look at the, I looked at cryptocurrencies and say, it's a, it's a phenomenon for the future. It is there. It's happening. So I can't deny it. But equally, I've got to assess the risks and the proposition to clients and different types of clients. And therefore, I am more cautious at this point in time because I've got those two lenses that are absolutely critical. Do, do clients want them, though? Yes, of course they do. No, not all clients. So are you, are you not missing all out on business? Yeah, but that's life. You know, I'm, at the end of the day, uh, you don't, as a, as a financial institution, you can't chase every piece of business that's going if you don't think it's the right piece of business. Just because a market is evolving in a certain way, um, you've got to make judgment calls as to which business you'll go for and which business you may not. Um, I firmly believe that central bank digital currencies are going to be there for the future, and I want to be part of that part of the market. I think there are certain forms of um, uh, stablecoin that equally can, can exist very well. But I'm not, I think we've got to see how the market evolves, but I look at those two lenses, and they're important lenses, because if you get either one of those wrong, you've got a conduct issue on client conduct, or you have a credit issue in that you've lent on the back of an asset base that is not real, yeah. or you've got a financial crime issue. But is your lens also tainted, not tainted, but tilted, because the UK regulator and probably the Chinese regulator are the harshest on cryptocurrencies? No. Or is that irrelevant? No, irrelevant. I look at it at that fundamental level, and I say it's an emerging market. It's a market that will emerge and be there and has emerged. But we as an institution have got to make a choice as to whether that market development, which bit of that market development we want to play in and which bit we don't want to play in, um, and we'll stay close to it. So, so through those two lenses, what needs to change for you to change Well, I, I don't think I'll ever do anything that is involved in a lack of transparency because you cannot be true to your commitments to regulators to operate a compliant financial crime environment a compliance environment if there is a lack of transparency on a transaction. You know, I can't move money around the world, hard currency around the world, without understanding counterparty risk. No international bank can. You put your license at risk. So why would I then do it in cryptocurrencies just because it's an emerging opportunity? Why would I do in the crypto world what I won't do in the real world, in the, in the hard currency world? Noel Quinn, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Francis.